Welcome to Where Parents Talk. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is a leading global researcher in the field of bilingualism and multilingualism. Dr. Viarika Marian is an endowed professor of communication sciences and disorders and a professor of psychology at Northwestern University. Her research focuses on how language operates in the brain. Dr. Marianne is a psycholinguist, an author, and a mother of three. Her latest book is called The Power of Language, How the Codes We Use to Think, Speak, and Live Transform Our Minds. Dr. Marianne joins us today from Evanston, Illinois. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Before we dive into some of your details of your research, could you paint a picture for us in terms of the current landscape of bilingual and multilingual people around the world? Sure. So there are a little over 7,000 languages spoken in the world today. And it is very common for people all over the world to grow up with two or more languages from early childhood and then acquire additional languages later in life. In fact, it is estimated that the majority of the world's population, more than half of the world's population, is bilingual or multilingual. It is very common in uh, countries all over the world, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa and South America to grow up with more than one language. So uh, for uh, the world at large, bilingualism and multilingualism is the norm. In North America, um, Canada is largely a bilingual nation and the United States, which has um, historically considered itself monolingual, the demographics here are changing as well. So currently about um, uh, one out of five households, about 22% of households uh, speak a language other than English at home as a primary language. But the proportions vary with some states like uh, Arizona, Florida, New Mexico, California, for example. Um, the proportion of bilinguals and multilinguals uh, is even higher. And uh, it's rapidly growing due in part to differences in birth rates as well as immigration. The number of uh, people of, who speak two or more languages in the United States is changing as well. So um, this is uh, really uh, an introduction to the linguistic landscape in which we find ourselves today. On that note, you've been studying this for over 25 years. Can you give us a sense of you know, the core area of your research and of your study? Sure. So I uh, am interested in how speaking two or more languages changes our brain, changes our health, changes our cognitive processes, changes our development, our interactions with others, our self-identity. As you can see, that's uh, a lot of questions. So uh, we've run many experiments with children as young as uh, two and uh, as adults as old as uh, on average 85 years old, looking at how being bilingual uh, or multilingual impacts their lives. And we are finding that the languages we speak have a profound influence on everything we do uh, and on who we are. So they really shape our lives, they shape how we perceive the world, world, how we interact with the world uh, in significant ways. What are some of the basic findings of your research that you believe parents might be surprised to learn about? There are so many. You would almost uh, um, need to specify an age range that we uh, want to look at. But I think I'd start. I'll start by saying that there is a lot of misinformation out there about raising bilingual children. Um, one of the biggest uh, misunderstandings is that um, raising 
So often parents are told that that raising children with more than one language will confuse them, will lead to language uh, delays or language disorders or cognitive problems. And uh, there is absolutely no evidence for that. So um, raising children with two or more languages will not confuse them. There is no evidence that being bilingual or multilingual is detrimental to one's cognitive development. And some of the biases that uh, uh, that surround this come from uh, older research uh, where research with children who spoke two or more languages had other confounding variables. So for example, if you look at some of that research was done on migrant children or on uh, um, people who didn't have a lot of education, who were living in a social um uh, and economical conditions that were uh, lower. So if you look at those populations, you can see differences. But when you look at uh, individuals, for example, in Canada and Europe, you don't see differences between bilingual and monolingual children. So uh, what it really comes down to is that poverty is bad for you and is affecting your uh, development, not being raised with two or more languages. So if you take out this confounding variables like uh, parental education, income, socioeconomic status, that you then you don't see any uh, uh, disadvantages and negative uh, impact, uh, negative outcomes to raising bilingual children. On the contrary, you see uh, multiple advantages and multiple benefits to uh, raising a child with two or more languages. So let's talk about some of those benefits, because the fact is, in many households, parents may speak one language, their kids might be the translators for their parents, and then the children go to school and they're learning a second language, maybe their primary language uh, in many households. So can you take us through some of the benefits of bilingualism or multilingualism? Yes, I can. But before I uh, answer that question, I do want to mention that the scenario that you described where children serve as brokers, language brokers for uh, parents and family members is actually not ideal for these children and places them often in, in, uh, in a difficult situation and challenges the traditional family roles that parents and children should have. So um, I think it's important to remind parents of the challenges that putting a child in this role of interpreter, caregiver, language broker um, puts the child in and the many negative uh, consequences that that can have for family dynamics, for children's development and for parents' well-being as well. That is not an ideal situation. And unfortunately, that's a situation that many immigrant parents often and find themselves in, but to the extent possible, I'd like to encourage uh, these family members, these uh, adults to uh, prioritize taking language lessons, uh, becoming fluent in the language of the country in which they live, uh, becoming as much as possible self-sufficient and, and independent so as to not lead to this role reversal and um, have to take their children out of school in order for them to translate at appointments um, and just really make sure that the children get a chance to still be a kid. Um, that's that's sometimes lost in this uh, immigrant family dynamic. So that's a, uh, 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 taking us around to the question that you asked, what are some of the advantages to growing up with two or more languages? And uh, some of them are obvious. You'll be able to communicate with more people. You'll be able to be exposed to multiple cultures and ways of thinking. You'll be um, uh, well-equipped linguistically when you travel. There is a relationship between um, uh, bilingualism and multilingualism and income and salaries later in life. You'll have more opportunities professionally, also uh, socially, interpersonally. But there are also some um, uh, other benefits, uh, including some um, some advantages to uh, cognitive development. For example, um, metalinguistic awareness kicks in early in bilingual children. When I, what I mean by that, it's this ability to reason about language in an abstract way. So for example, a bilingual child understands earlier that um, 
the word that you may have for an item, like this pen, for example, you can call it a pen or you can call it um, stilo or you can call it uh, ruchka. It doesn't change what this item is. Children understand earlier that the name and the object are not one and the same. They are two separate things. And this is a pretty um, advanced metalinguistic uh, skill, knowing that the world we have around us and the labels we use to label the world are not one and the same. That you can label something, whatever it is, you want to label it and it doesn't change the object. Monolingual kids acquire that ability a little bit later in life. Uh, so that's, for example, one um, one instance in which growing up with two languages can be beneficial. But the experience of living with two languages can translate to lifelong um, consequences, can have lifelong consequences. And one of the most remarkable ones is the fact that people who speak two or more languages um, experience some uh afforded some protection against some of the cognitive declines that we see with aging, including a delay of um, clinical uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia on the range of four to six years, depending on the study and the population. So it seems that this experience constantly juggling two or more languages gives our brain a workout, keeps our minds active and agile in a way that translates, that has this long-term uh, consequences later in life. So understanding the research and the science as you do, what would you say to parents who maybe want to, uh, you know, bring up a bilingual or multilingual child in terms of what that language instruction could optimally look like in the home and at school, and what age should that start at? I'll start with the second question, what age? Um, the sooner, the better, the earlier, the better. Uh, I would suggest uh, starting with both languages, especially if you speak more than one language in the home, as, a, as your parents, grandparents, family, community, from birth, right away, from the beginning, exposing your child to a rich linguistic environment is beneficial. The richer the environment, linguistic, visual, tactile, factory, the richer the environment, the better for the brain, the better for development. So right away from birth, uh, raising children with more than one language is, is wonderful. But it's never too late. If your child is already you know, a toddler, preschool, elementary school, middle school, or you yourself as an adult, it's never too late to start learning another language. So what I usually tell parents is the be best time is from birth and the second best time is now. Uh, so that's as far as the age question. Um, and then how to raise bilingual children. You'll be uh, happy to know that there is no one way there are many paths to bilingualism. There are many paths to successful, fluent, and happy bilingualism. And it really depends on your child's personality, on your family dynamic and structure. The approach that is most successful is the approach that works best for your family. And in some families, this may look uh, like having the parents speak uh, one language in the home and then the child experience another language outside the home or having one parent speak one language and another parent speak another language or having the extended family members, the grandparents only speak the other language or if it's an entirely monolingual family, um, putting the child in a child care where another language is spoken or hiring a, 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 a caregiver in the home who speaks another language or sending the child to uh, signing them up for uh, classes, like maybe maybe your, um, your church or your synagogue or your community has Sunday classes. So any of these paths are, are good paths, whatever will, it's just like anything else, like health habits, like investing, like um, weight, you know, whatever's going to uh, be something that you can stick with long-term that's what's going to be most successful. Um, right now, there are a lot of uh, ways to learn another language using apps and games, which a lot of kids enjoy because it really capitalizes on our brain's um, reward centers. So every time you get a word right, you you know hear a sound, or you see an image, or serotonin 
um, you know, your brain is firing up. So it can be rewarding to uh, learn another language that way as well. And you can actually combine all of these things. So you can use an app to learn a language. You can have language lessons. And then you can maybe take a family vacation to the culture or the country where that language is spoken. Now, you don't have to take a family vacation to another country. There are many neighborhoods in cities that have restaurants, festival events, communities um, that are really diverse. There could be, you know, a little... Um, community where you can attend performances and and interact with people who speak that language. Uh, so you don't need a lot of money to learn another language. You could even trade language lessons with uh, a person who wants to uh, learn the language, maybe an immigrant uh, family who um, came to this country and they speak a language you're interested in and you mutually teach each other the other language. Um, there are so many ways to become bilingual and to raise bilingual children. I think where there is a will, there is a way. And if you understand the benefits and the um, just the enrichment that knowing two or more languages can bring to your life um, and, and the joy and the richness of experiences um, that you don't have really access to when you don't speak those languages. And once you... Uh, decide that you'd like to add that to your life there are so many ways to do it um and and i would suggest finding the ways that bring you joy and and then it'll be become a pleasant enjoyable experience as opposed to oh my god yet another thing on my to-do list now very interestingly you are a product of the very research that you conduct having um grown up in a, a multilingual environment you're able to speak at least three languages that i'm aware of and maybe even more Take us through what that looked like for you in terms of what impact, as you look back on it, did you think it had on your life? And then with your kids as a mother, how do you go about uh, fostering that uh, language acquisition and embracing languages to them? Uh, sure. So I grew up in Europe. Uh, I grew up in Eastern Europe and my husband grew up in Western Europe. Um, he is from the Netherlands and I'm from Moldova. We met in graduate school in upstate New York in Ithaca at Cornell. Our common language is English. But um, in Europe, I think just, just about everyone is bilingual or multilingual. So, for example, in the Netherlands, you so his native language is Dutch, but then you uh, start learning multiple languages in school very early. So he's fluent in English. He's fluent in German. He knows some French. He knows some Spanish. My mother-in-law, who is now in her mid-80s, is similarly fluent in multiple languages. And that's very common for, for, um, for people in other countries. I myself am um, uh, a Romanian, but I grew up in Soviet Union. Uh, so I'm from the eastern part of Romania. There was a, um, a Soviet territory. So Russian was my second language. And then uh, I started speaking, uh, studying English in school. And later acquired a little bit of French, a little bit of Spanish, um, just just enough to, uh, as I say, get myself into trouble, but not enough to get out of it. But really, um, it's it's something that comes uh, naturally. I think when you grow up in a culture where multilingualism is supported by your community, it's a little bit like healthy living and healthy eating. If you live in an area that's um, that lacks access to healthy food or lacks access to fresh produce, you are not going to live a healthy uh, life. You're not going to have access to a healthy diet. In the same way, if you are living in a very monolingual environment, schooling is in one language, your entire community is just in one language, you're not going to be bilingual or multilingual. Whereas if you live in an environment where growing up with two or more languages is considered the norm, you acquire it just like you acquire literacy, or like you learn math. It just becomes a natural part of, of one's life. Um, so having said that, it's interesting because I did raise my children in the United States, which um, makes raising bilingual and multilingual children challenging. And what people often find, and my family is just... The research shows this and my family shows this. And I think many of your listeners will find that too, that with each child in the birth water, 
there is less and less bilingualism and more and more multi monolingualism. So the oldest child tends to be most fluent in multiple languages, and then the second child less so, and then the third child is more likely to um, uh, to not be as fluent in, in in the heritage language of the of the parents, because kids interact with themselves mostly in English eventually. So um, that's the case for us as well. Uh, as I was saying before, our common language is English. We speak English at home, um, albeit with the funny accents we all have. Our oldest uh, daughter speaks multiple languages, um, is fluent in multiple languages, and is interested in languages, both natural languages as well as computer languages, artificial languages. Um, and then the second and the third child, less so. They do take a foreign language in school. They do know some basic phrases and they can, you know, know the names of foods and they can have just a couple of phrases in other languages, but they're mostly monolingual English speakers. Um, and of course, we wanted them to, to be fluent in English. And I think a lot of uh, immigrant families really prioritize uh, the education of their children in the language in which um of the country to which they emigrated. This is another, I think, uh, myth that uh, people often have where they um, have these biases against immigrants without realizing that most immigrants would want nothing less than to assimilate and not to stand out um, and not to have their children be um, uh, identified as non-native English speakers. They want their kids to have the opportunities that a native speaker would have in that country. So that comes with advantages and disadvantages because yes, you have the child speaking fluently in the language of the country, but often losing their heritage language. So it's a challenge trying to maintain bilingualism and multilingualism in the home. Dr. Marion, let's talk about your book, The Power of Language. It has been described as revolutionary. In what ways do you believe it is revolutionary? Well, that's an interesting question. So most books about language are written from the point of view of monolinguals. They are written about, if you think about language and mind, if you're thinking about how language develops, language acquisition, language development, most books out there are from the perspective of a monolingual uh, community. It's as if everyone in the world is monolingual, which is, of course, not the case. So um, to think about language and mind as an entirely monolingual scenario and to only study the monolingual mind and language development in monolinguals leaves out a huge segment of the population, the majority of the world population, gives us an incomplete understanding of the human mind and of human capacity. And it gives us in fact, an inaccurate understanding of human potential, human mind, human brain. And you can think a little bit about medicine. Up until just a few decades ago, most medical research was done on men uh, and was done often on white men. And we now know that heart disease manifests differently in women than in men. Or diabetes manifests itself differently in the populations indigenous to North and South America who metabolize sugar differently than in white populations. So if we just study, you know, heart disease or diabetes in white men, we are getting an incomplete, inaccurate understanding of these conditions. By the same token, if we just look at the monolingual mind, we really don't get a full understanding of language, cognition, uh, the human con condition more generally. Um, so there is this famous quote by uh, Toni Morrison who said that uh, if there is a book you want to read but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And this book, The Power of Language, is the book I, as a person who speaks more than one language, have always wanted to read, but it hadn't been written. Um, I walk through libraries, bookstores, and there are all these books that don't reflect the experience of people who live their lives across two languages or more than two languages. Uh, I live my life in more than one language, and I 
wanted to bring this knowledge about how language and mind interact and speakers of more than one language to a general audience outside the lab, outside scientific papers, um, for people who can find their find themselves reflected in the pages of this book, find the experiences reflected, what is it's what it's like to be bilingual, how does it change us? And for people who are not bilingual or multilingual to get a better understanding of this ability that our brains have to accommodate and juggle multiple languages simultaneously. Let's dig into that a little bit. How would you go about summarizing or encapsulating how the brain processes multiple languages in layman's terms? I will start by saying that your brain never completely turns off the other language. That is another misunderstanding or misinformation that people have. People often think that as we speak English right now, any other languages that you know, perhaps if you speak French or Spanish, you've turned them off. It's as if you're using a language switch. You switch one language off, you switch the other one on, you use it, you switch it off, you switch the other on, and you sort of switch between the two languages in that way. That is actually not the case. Our brain um, is this amazing super organism that processes information in parallel at all times, and it processes languages in parallel at all times. Even though right now it's facilitating English because we're communicating in English, all the other languages that we know are also being processed and active to some extent, not to the same extent as English, but they are still active in the background. So our brain is constantly facilitating one language and controlling competition from another language because it would do little good uh, to our conversation if I suddenly started speaking Romanian or if you suddenly switch to French, for example. Um, so this ability to uh, constantly green light one language and red light the other language makes our brains um, really good at focusing on what matters and controlling what doesn't matter. This is one of the core skills um, and components of executive function that our brains have. And through this experience controlling multiple languages all the time, um, our brain gets really good at uh, processing competition and, and controlling parallel activation across uh, languages and across not just languages, going from this domain-specific experience with language to domain general experience uh, more globally. So um, it you can think about it a little bit like giving your brain a, a workout. Um, and it's a benefit that our brain gets all the time. So you often hear about the benefits of doing uh, word puzzles or um, Sudoku problems or engaging in some other cognitive uh, activity, which is wonderful and great. And we should all be doing reading and doing all of these other things. But with all those things, you have to take time out of your life, out of your daily schedule to engage in that activity. Whereas with bilingualism and multilingualism, Simply by knowing two languages, your brain is constantly controlling them. And 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 is you get this benefit simply by choosing which language you are going to talk to a person versus not. So it's uh um it's it impacts our brain continuously. We live more than ever in a very global world, regardless of the city, the country, the village that we are in. What can you say to a parent in terms of any other strategies that they could use to support their children to learn another language? Like anything else, creating positive associations between the child and the experience you want your child to engage in is key. And if, you, if you've tried to get your child to learn to play the piano or the violin or any of the, you know that already. Um, 
children are going to be resistant to some things and um and love some other things fortunately with languages you can find positive ways to create this positive associations between speaking another language and playing with a friend who speaks that language or between a language and the food that the child might like or language and um, uh, entertainment like movies or it really depends on the age of a child. But um, if you have that option, having the child watch shows in that language you want the child to know if the child is a teenager having their electronic devices use an interface in the other language um really re being enthusiastic and positive about those experiences not making it as a chore or something that is unpleasant um that's just the main thing and in, in in uh in ensuring that the child will want to learn another language and there are different strategies. Some parents choose to speak different languages on different days of the week, where, you know, Monday is English, Tuesday is French, and uh, Wednesday is Mandarin, for example. That's one way to do it. Other pair, other families would choose um, this, what's known as the one parent, one language approach. That's another way to do it. Uh, other families say, you know what, they will learn English or French or whatever the community language is. They will learn it by school, by childcare, when they go outside the home. So we'll prioritize our heritage language at home and speak that language at home. Um, that's another way to do it. Again, there are many paths to successful and happy bilingualism and multilingualism. Dr. Viarika Marian, endowed professor of communication studies and disorders, author of The Power of Language, Really fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you.